Peace and blessings, you guys. This is your girl, the Philly Bruja. Hey, y'all. Hey. So I decided to go ahead and make a playlist of all the true crime stories I've done over the last couple years. But I wanted to add this one as well. This is one of um, a series of uh, serial killers from Philly in Pennsylvania. What better to bring you these stories than the Philly girl, right? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and start this one off with Harrison Graham. Okay? Harrison Marty Graham. Now, a lot of you are probably saying, who the hell is Harrison Marty Graham? Right? Of course you are. It's very intriguing. See, what happened was around the time that uh, Harrison Graham had got caught right there was already a big media coverage on gary heidnick we'll get into him on a different uh video but they didn't live too far from each other now the reality is mr harrison marty graham who was actually still alive i believe he killed more people than gary heidnick did and a lot of people said that this didn't get a lot of coverage because all his victims was black females. True. I would tend to believe that as well. We're going to get into who he was, what happened, and where we are now. You know, or as I say, here we are now. <laughs> Whew. Okay. Mr. Graham, Harrison Marty Graham, was a piece of work. They dubbed him the Cookie Monster Killer. They also dubbed him as the Corpse Collector. And this is just a brief summary before we get into the thick of it, okay? In 1987, Harrison Graham, a.k.a. Cookie Monster. Evil Auntie, don't come for me. That is what they call him, okay? <laughs> what they did call him. So, 1987, Harrison Graham a.k.a. Cookie Monster, apartment in Philadelphia was raided by police and they found the remains of seven women. Graham told the police the bodies had been there when he first moved in, but later confessed to accidentally strangling them all during sex whilst he was under the influence of drugs. Graham had a Cookie Monster toy that he would sleep with and his defense claimed he had three personalities. Frank, which was a drug addict and a murderer. And then you had Junior, a two-year-old who could not be without the Cookie Monster. And Marty, a likable handyman who was compliant with the police. His defense, that he suffered from multiple personality disorder, was rejected by the judge. And he was convicted on all several murders. All seven murders. <clears throat> Due to his low IQ and mental illness, he managed to skip the death penalty and he became an ordained minister in prison. Now, that's just a brief summary. We're going to go ahead and get into who he was and how we got here. Harrison Marty Graham was evicted from his apartment on a sweltering August day in 1987 due to obnoxious odors. Inside, the police found the remains of seven women. Graham, 28 at the time, first stated that the bodies had been there when he moved in. The first officer to arrive bent down to a keyhole and saw a black woman's naked legs. He knocked and announced himself. With an investigator from the medical examiner's office, he forced the door and entered into the terrible room. The new female on the mattress was deceased. She had been dead for some time. Next to the mattress on a pile of trash was another female corpse. A homicide detective joined the search team around 3.45 p.m. They turned up a third set of remains, wrapped in two sheets and buried under debris beneath the second body. They were, they were nearly skeletal. So if you could just imagine, it's August in Philadelphia. It is super, super hot. So if you could just imagine the smell, okay? 
All the bodies they found, they were nearly skeletal, but had shreds of clothes on them. Less than two hours later, the searchers turned up a fourth set of mum mummified remains inside of some sheets. So you think about this, because hopefully we'll get into this. You, you do have people who was coming in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. The whole time, these bodies were there and smelling, okay? The fifth body was found around 5.30, pulled out another area of debris. But the peculiar detail about this one was that he or she, because they couldn't tell at the time, had been sandwiched between two mattresses. The searchers wondered if the evicted tenant had actually slept on top of the mattress with the victim underneath, like a dried flower smashed between pages of books. It appeared as though the tenant had resided in one room and had kept the adjoining room as his own private, like, mausoleum. Weird, right? Another two hours went by before a sixth body was located crammed inside a tiny six-inch deep closet sitting up, wrapped in a sheet and tied with an electrical cord. The search was on for the evicted tenant. When he left, Graham had taken a water bottle, some items of clothing, clothing, and his raggedy blue cookie monster. <clears throat> We're going to get into the whole cookie monster puppet thing in a minute. Investigators learned that Graham was known to take, take long walks and play basketball with local kids. He liked to entertain them with his cookie monster. Other neighbors said he was a loner, but when he got drunk, he acted a little crazy and talked to his puppet all the time. You guys... He actually used the puppet to strangle his victims as well. The very same puppets that he used to entertain the neighborhood kids. Is that not crazy or what? Okay. Graham was arrested on the street. He finally confessed to killing the woman in his apartment, but he was hazy on the details. He accidentally killed them during sex. He admitted and under the influence of drugs, he was full of remorse. <clears throat> Eventually, he went to trial. Among the seized evidence was his cookie monster puppet, which he asked to have back. I sleep with that, he said, but the puppet remained in evidence. I believe it's still in evidence as well. To Graham, multiple personality disorder, Harrison Frank Graham Jr. was presented as ha of having three distinct personalities. Frank, which was a foul-mouthed drug addict and murderer. Junior was an unmanageable two-year-old who adored Cookie Monster. And then you have Marty, who was the likable handyman who had complied with the police. Graham chose to have the judge decide the case. Apparently, his attorney and his mother had convinced him that the graphic evidence would strongly offend a jury. The prosecutors offered some powerful witnesses. Two women said they lived with Graham and survived, but just barely. One testified that during sex, he would place his hands around her throat and squeeze. Several times she thought that he was killing her. He told her, she said, that he killed one of his former girlfriends in anger. The second witness confirmed that Graham had confessed to the killings. He also threatened her with a machete. Moldowski asked this witness to pull the crusty Cookie Monster pup puppet out the bag of items, which was um marked as a evidence she did not want to touch it but she did admit that he chatted with it every day that she lived with him so the whole time she was living with him it's like bodies in it like you gotta be kidding me here a psychiatrist for the defense said that graham had said he could not recall the first five murders it was not possible to judge his mental state at the time of those crimes however during the two incidents he hallucinated the voices of both god and the devil thus he had been psychotic blinked and shook his head. Moldowski later told the reporters, I assume he knows he was found guilty, but I'm not sure. Graham asked to have his cookie monster back. The sentences were mixed of both life without parole and death. In an unusual move, the judge decided that Graham should not be executed until after he served the life sentence. Hmm? Moldowski found this ruling to be so Solomonic. And compassionate it meant that Graham had received a life sentence without the possibility of parole however his sentence went through a round of unusual challenges until the death um, sentences were vacated in 2003 due to his low IQ and indicators of early onset mental illness he was considered not competent to be executed behind the bars he became an ordained minister now 
that's just a brief summary of Mr. Harrison Marty Graham, aka the Cookie Monster. We're going to get into a little bit more. Now we're going to get into just a little bit more detail of his background and the crimes that were committed, okay? Harrison Graham, aka Marty. Classification, he is a serial killer. Mentally challenged drug abuser and necrophil necrophilia, okay? His number of victims is seven. He did the murders from 1986 through 1987. He was arrested on August 17th, 1987. His date of birth is actually September 9th, 1958, okay? All the female victims were black. His method of murder was strangula strangulation, okay? His status right now is uh, he is still sentenced to life imprisonment. And... Mm -mm. Because he was deemed incompetent to be executed on December 20th, 2003, okay? Harrison Graham was a 28-year-old mentally challenged drug abuser who lives in the, sorry, he lived in the slum district of Philadelphia and rented a third floor apartment. He actually lived in North Philly. He rented a third floor apartment of a slumlord because basically from the outside looking in, you would think that the building um, itself was abandoned, okay? He was evicted for the smells coming from his apartment. I don't know about you guys, but a dead body is a very distinct smell. Distinct smell. Very distinct, okay? But before he left, he nailed up the bedroom door claiming there was some property in there and he was coming back for it. When he never came back, authorities broke down the door and found seven bodies, all in various stages of decomposition. Only two bodies could be identified and one was of his former girlfriend. He turned himself into police and he admitted to strangling all of the women while having sex with them during and after his death. He was sentenced to life for seven counts of murder and seven counts of abusing a corpse. This man, not only when he killed them, he would have sex with the bodies after them, okay? Now, mm, I'm just going to go off of what it says here because I don't believe this is the, the correct, politically correct term anymore. But a mentally retarded drug abuser, Harry Graham was well known in Philadelphia's in his Philadelphia neighborhood. Sometimes he would amuse the local children with his Cookie Monster public um, puppet. Other times they found him digging graves for dogs. He said in nearby vacant lots, he had dogs. You guys, so when they died, he would he would bury them. Apparently, no one suspected that a simple mind might hide a darker urge compelling him towards murder. Now. What I did discover, you guys, is that um, Mr. Harrison Marty Graham, he, I don't know, sometimes some people are born and it's like they don't have a goddamn chance at all whatsoever. And this is no way of me being sympathetic to the murders that he committed. This man um, was actually sold into prostitution, believe it or not, um, at a very young, like, as a child. He was sold into prostitution and his pimp was also his lover. This is a man that pimped out this small boy child. Um, that's enough to, you know, for your mind to break down and create personalities to deal with, you know, different traumas. But um, again, like I said, this is no way of me feeling sympathetic for this man whatsoever. Okay. In early August, 1987, in early August, 1987, Graham quarreled with his landlord nephew, okay? Afterwards, he was um, evicted from the apartment. And like I said before, he had um, shut, he had nailed the door shut out of spite, basically. <clears throat> and when the police was summoned on the afternoon of August 9th, when neighbors filed a complaint of the odor, inside the patrolman, like we talked about earlier, found two strangled women's bodies. And as they kept digging and digging, they kept finding more and more bodies in several different, um, various degrees of decomposition, okay? Now, the crazy thing is that, um, they, he only lived about three miles away from Gary Heidnick's House of Horror, okay? Which was another whole case, but uh, which I'm sure most people are, um, more so aware of than, uh, Harrison Marty Graham, Okay? 
The roof of Graham, uh, Graham's building also has skeletal remains of the victim, a victim number seven. Uh, you'll see in the pictures that I have in here of the victims, they still don't know who number seven was or is or was. Um, but initial warrants simply charged the missing suspect uh, with abuse of a corpse, okay? Murder was not proven until uh, August 11th, right? When a medical examiner reported that the freshest victim had been strangling, strangled sometime in the past 10 days. On August 14th, another skull, partial skeleton, was um, excavated from the dirt floor of a row house three doors down from Graham's building. So this was an uh, abandoned building three doors down, okay? He surrendered two days later and confessed to seven murders since the winter months of 1996. According to his statement, Grants picked up female addicts on the street, enticing them with others, excuse me, enticing them with offers of a fix. He brought them home where they were murdered after sex. Now, I don't know if they're really going to get into this because I was reading from, this is like from the news story, but from um, the different... The uh, different stories and cases in the dockets that I was able to pull up on here um, in regards to Mr. Harrison Graham, he actually struggled with the fact of being a homosexual, right? But with him being homosexual, I don't know if his early childhood trauma is what triggered um, the confusion and his mother being very um, spiritual and whatnot, it, that was like completely against everything they stood for. But I'm confused by that because it's like, your child, you, this little boy, was kind of like giving away into prostitution to a pedophile, basically. Okay. So it's like, ooh. anyway. In August 20, on August 26, psychiatrists declared that he was incompetent for a trial. Excuse me, that he was competent for a trial, okay? <clears throat> in April of 1988, dispensing with his rights to trial by a jury, Graham led his case before a solitary judge. Convicted on seven counts of first-degree murder and seven counts of abuse of a corpse, he was sentenced to life imprisonment, followed by six... Um, Unusual sentences held by Graham's lawyer as compassionate and brilliant. Theoretically, it shows that he will never be paroled whatsoever. I mean, that's a good thing, right? He killed seven women. All right. During the 1980s, the city of Pennsylvania became home to three notorious serial killers. We will get into them. We got Gary Heidnick. Let me see if I can get my aunt to talk about that. A.K.A. the Frankfurt um, Slasher, who murdered seven people and held several more women in torture chambers. He retrofitted out of his North Marshall Street home basement. Then we have a man of Leonard Christopher was arrested after an escaped victim turned eyewitness linked the killer to at least seven murders of females in the Frankfurt area. Finally, during the summer of 1987, police responds to a complaint of residents living in a decrepit apartment complex in North Philly. Behind a door nailed shut by its renter, Women's decomposed bodies were found on that sweltering day. I just cannot imagine the smell. What's even worse is that even though those women were addicts, those were seven sets of families who lost a loved one who they did love and who they do love. And this didn't make any of the headlines outside of Philly. It's crazy. There's no such thing as one murder more heinous than the next. Whenever life is stolen, degrees of less tolerable or impossible to measure. We consider a murder, shake our heads in disbelief, and wonder how and why. What sorts of monsters are capable of stealing their life? Who does this? Is it evil, a bondage to darkness, and takes over and possess and creates literal boogeymans? Perhaps certainly... It's worthy of an examination. Sometimes we can actually look at the murderer and see the missing links in his character and wonder to ourselves how someone somewhere along the way did not point a finger and say, hey, someone needs to intervene here. You know, you guys, when you see those kids who's out there killing animals and decapitating and all kinds of crazy shit. I mean, I actually seen someone do that. Well, the after effect. These little boys, they just started killing a box of kittens. Like, what the... F that, that would be a problem. 
there would be like a timeout here. <laughs> Hello, what's going on here? You know, but when researchers look back at this infamous serial killer, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, okay, a background of abuse to animals and uh, path pathological uh, cruelty is uncovered. You got Charles Manson spent most of his youth in reformatory school. And then opposite, we got Ted Bundy, who murdered at least two dozen women. He had no criminal background. He was able to elude suspicion all his life, all the while harboring obsessive sexual um, fantasies. Harrison Graham could not be categorized in any of these um, categories at all. He was not cruel to animals. He was not in and out of youth camps, nor did he charm people with his courtesy and flirtation. Okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was a rag flag waving high in the street, begging for supervision, crisis intervention, and intervention in the most major way. It was so humid on Sunday, August 9th, 1987, it felt like if he tried to cut the air with a knife, with a knife, you fell. It would have been unimaginable living in urban squalor near Cecil B. Moore Avenue. That provided tenement living to the poor and to the desperate. I mean, technically, this building should have been condemned, you guys. I tried to put up, um, pull up old pictures of the building. Uh, everything I, I pulled up, that's no longer there. Okay. Still, I guess it was better than no home, which was becoming more of a reality as the city continued to board up and close shops um, of various mini buildings. Okay. And then you have the ones that was overcome by the drug dealers, the pimps, and a resulting endless stream of officers just failing through <sighs> tons of drug busts and domestic disputes, okay? 1631 North Street appeared to be abandoned. If one were prone towards dark secrets such as uh, a venue, this may well have served that purpose. Water sometimes ran, then again sometimes it didn't. The front entrance to the building consisted of broken down doors, rubble obstructing the opening. If you're from Philly, you, you can totally mention this. Because there is some sections in Philly where it, it totally looks like um a third world uh, war ridden place. Okay, it's terrible. And I'm like, this is America. Okay. Then you have uh, the front windows have been shattered, providing free entry into the apartments. The fact that they actually was paying rent on this shit is mind-boggling. Okay? It almost seems reasonable that drugs was paramount. Reds and blues. Ritalin. I didn't even know <laughs> Ritalin was the thing back then, but okay. And Tawin. Uppers, downers, anything to none the suffering from the unbearable heat, the purgatory of hopelessness, the fear that could be even worse. So then we have Officer Pete Scalanto was the first to respond to the complaints of the foul odor on that afternoon. He recognized the scent of death as he entered into the dilapidated stru structure. Following his instincts, his, um, his senses, he climbed the stairs to the third floor until he reached an apartment which um, screamed of rot. <sighs> I am going to probably be inserting the a few pictures I found from the crime scene, okay? The front room, which was accessible from the hallway by an open door, was filled with materials of stench, food containers, molded newspapers and magazines, dry feces, filthy clothes, piled knee-high. On the wall was rough sketches, one um, particularly disturbing drawing of a naked woman. Um, ugh. Accessorized with someone's verbal um, <sighs> feces and dry blood poured over it. This is this is on a drawing that he had hanging up. Um, the officer walked past the kitchen to a door he assumed led to a room. The smell, oh God, I couldn't even imagine this. The smell was thickening around him and he felt a certain calls was coming from behind the door. The name Marty was etched into the door. And below was an open keyhole. He leaned down and peered through. And he was able to see a human figure. He demanded the doors to be open. But the legs he could see were motionless. Scalanto called for backup. With the help of investigator Charles Johnson. The door was pried open. And the body of a black female lying on a mattress was in full view. The body was bloated from decomposition. Ugh. Next to the mattress was a second body, another female sprawled dead on the floor. 
The two men needed more help. It was difficult to assess whether the deaths were actually drug-related or a homicide. As detectives begin to show up, a crowd begin to gather. My thing is, where was this crowd when that shit was smelling? I'm, come on. Okay, I just can't assume that everyone knows what a dead body smells like, okay? But that is a very distinct smell. So police had taped off the scene. And as um, authorities filtered through the waste, a third... One second, y'all. So a third body was discovered underneath more debris, okay? The victim was skeletal, which meant that whatever had been going on at 1631 North had been going on for quite some time. The search continued. Men, Donnie Mass, braved through syringes and spoons and broken glass, dog feces everywhere, and human remains within mere hours uncovered a fourth victim. This body also appeared less than human in its remain, which had been mummified in a sheet, carefully binding um, its occupier. Ugh. A search that had begun in the early afternoon was now into the sunset hours. At 5.30, the search party discovered by 5, by number 5, I'm sorry, the search party discovered by number 5, hidden between the two mattresses, this body had not been wrapped or bound. He left to decompose past the point of um, gender identification. An officer called to the men in the back room. He had found a body in the front closet littered with garbage and tattered old clothes. A light rain accompanied the muggy temperature. Oh, I could just imagine it smell because I don't know. Uh, in Philly in the summertime, it's a different kind of heat. I've been to a whole lot of different places around this world, you know, um, islands and things of that nature. That's a good kind of heat. Philly has this real stagnant air heat, you know, like no escaping it. And you can like cut, cut the thickness. So I just can't even imagine braving that and going, uh, smelling a body and feces and, oh, <sighs> mm -mm -mm. With the body count at six, the search was called off until the morning. The crowds of people gathered around the building, beyond the neighbors and the locals. The media had caught wind of a potential serial killer spree in the urban Philadelphia. And new teams were, I'm sorry, news teams were gathering among the homeless, the pimps and the prostitutes, the junkies and the other desperate of the community. August 10th, the search was broadening to the outside of the apartment structure. Officers and crews began to dig. A search atop the building found more body parts. A leg and a foot dismembered. Morning new newspapers displayed the tenant's picture, a handsome young black man appearing in healthy physical condition. His name below the picture read Harrison Graham. An APB has sheriffs and officers and every other authority in the area on the lookout for him. Because remember, you guys, he mm -hmm. had boarded it up and then he left. Right. He boarded it up. He left talking about when he was coming back or whatever. So the victims that were um autopsies. All types, the victims who, who had autopsies done, there were no signs of physical trauma or violence that was found. The first two bodies had decomposed rapidly as a result of the weather. They had, in fact, been dead for a few days. While the coroners were able to assess their gender as female, the other victims were less identifiable. During all this, the Daily News printed a story about the relatives and friends of Cookie Mathis, a victim. I do have the, um, the story... In the, the, the newspaper um, story that was done on her. Um, I can link that in here because I don't think I'll have enough time to put that in this. Um, her name was Cookie as well. She was among the victims. Her husband heard about the shirt found on her body and knew it was his wife. He brought it for her. Now, anthropologists were brought in to dissect information from tissue and bones. Within a week, the public was served to be more aid in helping police solve identities of these um, seven women. The media was running stories about the madman on the loose as Harrison was still on the large. Could you imagine that? Oh my God. <sighs> a husband came forward to inquire about his wife who had been missing for over two years. The roommate of another victim told authorities that he believed Sandra Gavin, excuse me, that she believed Sandra Gavin had gone to buy drugs from Harrison. She had not returned. I mean, at some point, do you, when do you say, okay, well, my roommate hasn't returned in some time. Uh, I think I better tell somebody, but whatever. That's, that's crazy. All right. 
She went to buy drugs from him, um, from Harrison. She never returned. Further debris from the crime scene filled in missing pieces, which was jewelry, including a heart-shaped necklace. Three earrings uh, were newsworthy. Photos brought in answered from the public when relatives stepped forward to help identify another two victims. Harrison Graham was still nowhere to be found. The sought-after suspect had four younger siblings and his mother, Lily, all living in the Philadelphia area. The family put out a public plea for Harrison to come home. He'd been seen at local shelters, even on a city bus, but has somehow continued to elude investigators. Investigators continue to search the condemned building atop, beneath, and adjunct it. Some bones um, were exhumed from the grounds surrounding the apartment, but a lot of those um, were actually animal remains, not uh, human. Uh, Marty... Believe it or not, he had a lot of dogs here and there, here and there, here and there. He was like a dog kind of person. So he would bury his dogs when he had, you know, when he passed away or whatever. So they found a lot of those bones as well. On August 15th, however, another body was found. The search had expanded to surrounding buildings in the basement of a complex down the street from Graham's, re Graham's uh, residence. We talked about that earlier. It was another um, home a couple doors down that um, was also like, I guess it looked abandoned as well. Okay, this body was found wrapped in a blanket and bound with an electrical cord. Human beings was discovered under what um appeared to be a burn pile. Upon scrutiny, it appeared other sorry. Upon scrutiny, it appeared only the torso and the skull remain, leading investigators to question if this was actually an, an eighth victim or if this was uh in connection to any of the previously found leg bones. With the search for Harrison Graham intensifying, the medical examiner was attempted to attach the names to the bodies. One female had been identified as mother of five, Mary Jeter Mathis, while the officer, excuse me, while the office personnel worked feverishly to piece the puzzle together. You got Lillian Graham, who received, who received um, a phone call that could provide investigators with a bunch of air, um, answers, okay? from Harrison on August 17th the phone rang at Lillian Graham's Philadelphia residence that's his mom it was uh his eldest son sorry her eldest son hungry and tired he wondered if she might meet with him and bring him something to eat according to Harrison his mother was able to talk some sense to him stop running son whatever happened we can work this out just come on home we love you your family loves you Harrison waited at the street corner for the police to pick up, to pick him up. At first, I couldn't say it. God help me, I couldn't tell them. But the Lord hath helped me. I know how sin is. It overtook me, at least it wasn't me. This is what he said to the police, okay? It was getting late, but the persistent officers continued to press um, and then to detained the suspect until finally he admitted he admitted that he had played a role in the murders of the seven women he tried for hours to convince the men that the bodies had been there when he moved into the complex right reluctantly he would admit to one killer and then finally relented and told the whole truth with a twist it may have been his hands but it was not his mind it was marty he explained now Marty was supposed to be, well, he, he had the three personalities. So wouldn't it be Frank, right? The drug dealing murderous one. But at this particular juncture, he's blaming it on Marty, the lovable handyman. Okay. So he said, it may have been my hands, but it was not my mind. It was Marty. He explained, my mama told me to read my Bible and hell hath no place for sin, but he does these things. I love my Bible and I have no place for these things has done, uh, for I have done these things. Harrison Graham, this is what he said in 1998 from the Harrisburg Penitentiary. I cannot, for no reason, I can't find it at all. Okay. I was looking for the actual, um, the confession. So I was not able to locate that, nor am I willing to call or phone a friend. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. Now listen, I'm giving y'all what I got. Okay. Uh, yeah, he made this claim um, when he did an interview in 1998. Okay. When Harrison was a small boy, and this is where we get into, you know, what actually could have, you know, taken place here. Right. <clears throat> 
And so when Harrison was a small boy, uh, a small boy, according to both his version of his life and um, more from research of investigators, his uh, family situation was not always sound. At an early age, he was both the lover to an employee of a male pimp. Troubles at home led him to the streets where for the first time Harrison claimed to have, have felt deeply loved. He was introduced, introduced to homosexual relationships and prostitution and also to do drugs. In his early teens, his mother's um, own spiritual revelation was imposed upon him. She's very Christian. She dragged him from the streets. He come to know um, as home and begin to preach the, um, the uh the immoral, the moral <laughs> sense of uh, his lifestyle. One she's been utterly uninvolved in for a very long time. Okay. Not even the most seasoned psychologist could explain for certain why Harrison Graham became a serial murderer. However, even the latest person could point out a specific incidents in his childhood and adolescence that were surely significant in splitting his personality. One part of him was like a loving compassionate rehabilitated Christian son who was opposed to homosexual um anything right and then you had the other part of his personality which was a homosexual addict with an insidious passion for underbelly of the street living okay it would only be a matter of time until he would develop a name for his altered state once established, all guilt could be carried out by one entity, leaving the other persons to live a f life of free. I'm sorry, live a life free of responsibility of both his perverse sexual needs and his drug habits and ultimately his serial crimes. It is both tragic and unsurprising that among his victims was his former girlfriend, Robin um, DeShazer. Graham stated in an interview, I wanted so badly to love her. But I could not stop my need to do the other things. I never liked the sex. And it got so much easier when I didn't have to see her. Hmm. To explain, Harrison somehow felt more at ease having sex with his girlfriend once he strangled her. This is where the necrophilia comes in, okay? In a sense, he said, his secrets were safer with her dead. She knew about Marty and the desires that came along with Marty. Um, he didn't want her looking at him that way. Uh, he said that he saw God angry with him in her eyes. Harrison Graham lured all of his victims, whether he knew them previously or met them on the streets with the drugs. Consensual sex led to strangulation, which Harrison explains always shocked him in the morning. When he'd awake to find a woman lying next to him dead. He used that cookie monster puppet also um, in the midst of his murders by strangling them with the cookie monster puppet on. Harrison confessed to the police that with his first victim, the Shazer, he was so shaken by what he'd done. He was so afraid as to what to do next that he simply just left her body in the apartment. And it was not until he brought a different woman to his apartment that he attempted to conceal her by hoisting the, cor the, um, the corpse up into, um, into the roof through a bedroom window. Hey, y'all, it was still people coming in and out of this building, okay? Believe it or not, even though it looked abandoned, there were still other tenants. This is ridiculous. During the interrogation, Graham wrote a 10-page confession. I cannot find it online. And again, I wasn't willing to phone a friend. However, during his arraignment, the question of mental illness was the topic. Okay, Joel S. Moldowski was appointed as his public defender and immediately the point of whether Graham had been capable of signing his own confession, a.k.a. death certificate, death certificate was argued. While detectives claimed that the confessions had been um, sound and he was, you know, within his present mind um, and also with, with his mother present. OK, the detective was able to successfully point to due process conflict. Harrison, he claimed, was never told he had a right to have an attorney present. OK, in spite of that, in spite of the heated, emotionally charged facts surrounding the murder case, his rights were still to be protected. 
So then, um, okay, we go down to August 27th in 1987. A detective read through the gruesome accounts of finding um, the findings of during a six hour hearing. Harrison was reportedly agitated, rocking back and forth as the detective read the defendant had described maggots in his apartment as um, furball bugs to a visitor. He had he had to stay high all the time to ignore the birds eating the bodies outside of his window drugged it in a paranoid state to begin with harrison panicked when the police arrived literally throwing the bodies into the back room until this point he has staged the corpse um, of his most recent murders in the front room in a chaotic flurry he hurried and boarded up the doors and ran this according to um the detective among other characteristic bizarre behaviors were paramount in determining his clients i'm sorry this was his um his attorney his public defender Moldowski, my bad further dr robert stanton the psychiatrist evaluated graham citing his iq of 63 which is considered to be less than mentally um, competent this coupled with substance abuse and, addic and addiction resulted in a man who according to the laws of state of philadelphia was incapable Harrison was suffering from chemically induced hallucinations, psychosis, blackouts, and chronic paranoia. Moreover, um, a psycho psychologist by the name of um, Albert Levette, he testified that aside from the defendant chemical and psychological issues, Harrison was incompetent and fundamentally academically skilled, and he was not competent in reading, writing, math, and telling time. In a rather shocking turn with evidence to the contrary, Judge Edward Meikle, still declared Graham competent for trial. Of course. <laughs> he based his opinion in part on the DA's counselor, Robert Sardoff, who had told reporters that he felt Harrison had been utterly able during the initial confession. All right. Contrary to the prosecution's stance, Moldowski or, um, argued insanity, specifically a multiple personality disorder, which I told you from the beginning. You got Frank, Jr., and Marty. Okay. Um, the attorney commented that Harrison Graham often spoke in a second and third personality. Marty was the easygoing um, handyman. He liked his mother. He was heterosexual and he was very religious. At the time, Junior would show himself. That personality was most familiar as the childlike Mill, whose neighbors um, remembered hanging out with his little cookie monster stuffed animal um, and playing with the kids. There was never anything, um, no one ever said that this man ever hurt any children. Um, he would actually kick into the Marty character. I guess that particular personality would um, would jump in and play basketball and do the Cookie Monster voice with the Cookie Monster um, puppet. Because he was always seen with it, no matter what. Like, the puppet was always there with him, okay? Um, let's see. Scrolling down, looking at this evidence here. Okay, the most familiar of his childlike males, who neighbors reported remembering hanging out with his his uh cookie monster stuffed animal. It was Frank who was responsible for the heinous crimes of both murder and necrophilia. It was Frank who could not stand to be with a woman. In brutal contrast with Marty, who hated the sinful nature of homosexuality. He also felt um like being homosexual was going to condemn him to eternal death. Frank, however, was streetwise with a desire for drugs and harder core homosexual relations, including his own prostitution. So he was selling ass too. Okay. Again, something he had been introduced to in his own adolescence. We, we discussed that earlier. Okay. In fact, Harrison was involved in a fight in prison and blamed his part on Frank, uh, which King dismissed as Harrison's grim ability to fake it. The psychologist, Daryl, um, Gerald Cook offered a statement that he had um, organic brain damage although he was not an expert on the subject and the issue had already been dismissed by a neurologist cookie i'm sorry cook also said that graham suffered from sexual sadism which is not a mental illness that makes a person insane or um would render them not guilty okay so he seemed to be very ineffective as a witness on this basically he was a psychologist making statements that he really couldn't back up okay <laughs> miss graham was her um son's greatest ally she did not believe she stated that harrison would be capable of such horrible crimes you know they're saying not my baby my son didn't do nothing to nobody 
She reasoned that he was too simple and too nonviolent. Even had he ever gone off due to the alcohols or drugs, he's been accused. He's never been accused of abusing anyone. He would not have had the wherewithal to plan such crimes. I don't think it was much planning involved here. I mean, he left these bodies out. Okay. Um, and when he did try to hide it, I mean, it was really, come on. Anyway, as adamant as she was, she guided her son away from a jury trial, okay, explaining to him that while he was innocent, she knew that the jury would be prejudiced once the prosecutor revealed their crime scene photos. I uh, do have my hand on some of those. I am not going to be posting um, the ones with any bodies in there out of respect to the victims and their families, just in case they ever came across this, because honestly, I didn't find that much on him in, on uh, YouTube. I had to actually go and bring up the dockets and, you know, public information, the dockets and things of that nature and see what was pulled um, from from evidence. OK, in crime scene photos. Then just before the judge ruling, the prosecutor entered a surprise witness. This is where I get fucked up. Paula. A woman who had claimed to live with Harrison, she accused Harrison of strangling her during sex, causing her to pass out at times. She also said that during the three years that she lived with this man on and off, he had bragged about strangling Robin um, DeShazer, which was his girlfriend, remember, and then having sex with her dead body. Um, Paula had been frightened that he would do the same thing to her if she broke off their relationship. His excuse for strangling the woman to death was simply because they tried to leave him. But Paula didn't dare. Hmm. According to her testimony, the woman had endured rape, beatings, and torture at the hands of Harrison Graham. What was supposed to be a cue for the state turned out to be an accomplishment for the defense. First, Robin had uh, been beaten, not strangled, leading to the conclusion that the witnesses had lied about her former boyfriend's testimony. Further, Harrison had no history of long-term relationships. In fact, he had killed his only um, so-called girlfriend. It did not fit the pattern of Graham's murders or the personalities to have maintained a three-year relationship with any woman. Then that makes sense to me. I mean, he got three personalities. One was childlike. One was a um, <laughs> was Omar from The Wire, right? A homosexual uh, <laughs> killer, right? Drug dealer. And then you had Marty, the lovable Christian son, right? All right. If anything, Paula's statements that Harrison kept her in a drug-induced stupor and was often using um, himself only added to the stability of defense claim that the defendant was not in control of his faculties. Actually, and then from when I was looking at the paperwork, they were kind of saying that um, this Paula person who was supposed to be like the surprise witness, like they didn't even really know each other like that. So I don't know where that came from. On March 8th, Harrison Graham told the judge that he was not responsible for the murders and that someone else had done it. Harrison put his fate in uh, Judge Latrone's hands, waiving his rights to a jury. He was found guilty of first degree murder and abuse of a corpse on all counts. His attorney told reporters that he doubted Graham knew that he'd been found guilty of what the ramifications could or would mean. He then directed his own attention towards keeping Graham from execution. The large black man listed to his, um, to his conviction barely making a wince. No, excuse me, back it up. The large black man listened to his conviction. And he didn't show any kind of reaction, y'all. It's almost as if he didn't, he wasn't comprehending what they were saying here. You got like seven life terms here, buddy, okay? Afterwards, he told a reporter that everything will work out just fine. <laughs> And then he requested to have his cookie monster be given back to him now that he was no longer needed. Now that the cookie monster, uh, Teddy Hand Puppet, excuse me, was no longer needed as evidence. Bruh. Maldowski was never required to fight the good fight for his client. This is the public defender, you guys. In May, Judge Latrone ruled that while he would sentence the defendant, Harrison Graham, to six death sentences, he would be first um, reprimanded to... Prison to serve out his life term. The single life sentence was for um, uh, DeShazer murder. She was the first, so there was no other murders to add aggravating factors. So then he was, um, hmm. then he, he has to serve <clears throat> 7 to 14 years for each after his life term, um, Harrison's mother had not been able to make herself present for the ruling. However, his attorney was greatly relieved to find in the judge motion as um, Solomonic. And that, that's kind of like merciful. 
And it was by allowing um, Harrison to serve his convictions of death prior to his life sentence. And he had achieved a life sentence without possibility of parole. Um, and, you know, his sentence wasn't death. While some scoffed at his compassion, it was nevertheless true that Harrison had learned to adapt to unthinkable circumstances as a boy. And that in part to survive, it was acceptable to believe that he developed altered personalities. I believe that's true, y'all. In my opinion, just my opinion alone, I could see how a child would um, develop these different um, personalities to, to handle whatever situation came up. That's not an uncommon characteristic in broken adults, which stems from tragic early uh, childhood conditions. King also felt that the conviction was in all interest and protected everyone involved. The victims, the victims, family, Harrison Graham from Harrison Graham himself. OK, until 1994, Harrison Graham was a prisoner at Harrisburg Penitentiary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And then the Supreme Court, after routine uh, review, deemed his sentence unethical and illegal. Hmm? The court ruled that J uh, Graham's life sentence be overturned and that the death sentence be in implemented again. He was in scheduled to die December 7th, 1988. Then um, the same judge, Judge Latrone, was again in the position of making the decision to let Graham live or die. He stayed the execution. The murderer's case seemed to spend much of his time in appeals in and out of higher courts until in 2002, the U.S. Supreme Court banned the execution of all mentally retarded cr criminals. Harrison did not meet the initial requirements of the ban as stated by a psychiatrist involved in this case. He tested lower than he functioned. So even if his IQ was below 70, he was still technically not considered to be mentally retarded. But because according to the cr um, criteria established by the American Psychiatry Association, that on an on-site, I'm sorry, onset of mental illness occurred before the age of 18. Okay, and that mandated the same relief from execution. So Harrison Graham was permanently off of death row. This is where he sits at today. I'm going to post that as well. Okay. Today, and here we are now, and here we are. <laughs> Today, Harrison resides in a medium security facility in Pennsylvania. His case manager um, describes him as a mild and nonviolent. I'm sure he's medicated as well. Uh, the thing with the... <sighs> A lot of times with the black community, man, and I'm pretty sure it was much more prevalent um, in the 80s as well. You know, and kind of like thumb your nose and look down at people for actually getting help. You know what I mean? And people, people of color, like they don't want that kind of. I'm, I'm not saying all because, you know, I, I totally believe in in therapy um, for everybody, as a matter of fact, you know, but I can see how people. At the time, didn't want to take his medication, didn't even want to even get a diagnosis, you know, back then. And, and people would self-medicate. People self-medicate now. Hmm. Huh. Anyway, right now he resides in a medium security facility in Pennsylvania. Um, he is a minister, okay, and continues to practice his faith religiously. And I'm sure he practices taking his medicine religiously. It's often said of um, substance abusers that once the drug is removed, insanity returns. This may be the case for Harrison Graham. And faced with the hauntings of his childhood demons, his ability to deal with them alone, past the security of his routine and his cell walls, provide the structure and predictability he never knew growing up. And yet when I called to interview him, he still told me that he could only do the interview if I promised to call him Marty. Now that was from the person who had wrote this um particular article where I read a couple um excerpts from it or whatever I don't know <sighs> I think it's kind of messed up that it was seven black women who was missing never reported missing you're talking about almost two years here um and Gary Heidnick was all over the news and all over everywhere um and nobody really cared about these women. Like I always say, like she has a name. She has a name. They had family. They had loved ones. But it, it's, it was just kind of swept away. This man killed seven people. Seven women. Serial killer. Anything more than three is a serial killer. 
it I don't know I just didn't see much about him on YouTube so I figured I will go ahead and um put his story out here uh, more so too you know you got the victims and the victim families that's still out there you know and while you had Gary Heidnick who was making nationwide news this one kind of just slipped under the radar I don't know, being, a, being a, a black woman myself, like, shit, we do matter. We do matter. I could get into the whole story of um one of the victims. Uh, her mother has stated in a newspaper article uh, that she, she knew that she was going to die. And for me... When I read that, it just kind of gave me chills because I remember my own family members saying that like, hey, like they knew they, they had a premonition or something that they were going to die. This woman came from a very loving family. Um, her name was she was her nickname was Cookie as well, y'all. And um, she had a very good life for the most part, you know, very normal upbringing. And she had gotten into drugs like a lot of people had gotten into drugs in the 80s. She had got caught up in it or whatever. She had a, um, a degree in nursing. And she was a fairly young woman. Very young. Very beautiful woman. Um, so my condolences to all of his victims. And, and to their families. I hope they've been able to heal from something. like. Although, nah, you never really heal from something like this, to be quite honest. Um, you learn to deal with it better. Some days are good. Some days are bad. You know. But, yeah. I hope you learned some stuff from this in regards to this particular serial killer, Mr. Uh, Marty Graham, Harrison Marty Graham to be exact. Uh, condolences to his victims and their families. May they have peace and healing now. And um, yeah, that's all I got for you for today. I'll try to do um, a true crime story or, or like my whole thing was I like to do um, the weird, obscure news, and especially if it has anything to do with supernatural or, um, you know, the underbelly of that type of genre. So I'll be bringing this series to you as far as the Philadelphia, the different Philadelphia and Pennsylvania serial killers. And then from there, I'll see where I'll go with it. But I hope you enjoyed um, this first one in our Philadelphia uh, serial killer Um series i'm going to have going on like i did with the other series please if you get a moment go back in and and take a look at my other true true crime stories one was very interesting with the the granny cult leader a person who actually stayed with her actually popped into the comments i was like whoa ma'am you dodged a bullet right crazy and then you have um the young woman who was accused of killing like a whole bunch of people I called it the voodoo murderers, right? And, and then come to find out after I was doing mad research on that, like, I didn't think she was guilty whatsoever. Um, but yeah, that's all I have for you today. Hey, be good to yourself and be good to others. You have a wonderful, wonderful day, y'all. Or evening, whichever it is, whenever you're watching this video. <laughs> Peace. Deuces.